Shubhra Goyal and we will be talking about or covering about all about the upper face rejuvenation. Um, the course would be conducted by me, myself and Dr. Kasturi Bhattacharji. I'll be just giving a brief introduction about both of us uh, for your reference. Uh, the course would be uh, structured in such a manner where we would be covering about uh, the aging trigger points, which is the new concept and can we actually prevent aging or how does it help? Uh, a word on the aesthetic consultation because the consultation is the prime thing when you are discussing any aesthetic procedure with the patient. And then we are dividing it into upper face and lower face surgical and non-surgical uh, treatment modalities followed by the discussion. So uh, this is my pedigree of training and uh, these are my you know uh, credential the associations or the disclosures and uh, apart from that um, i love being what i am i'm a vegan i follow the plant-based diet and when i'm not practicing what i love doing the most i love decorating the houses as a passion uh dr uh, Dr. Kasturi Bhattacharji needs no introduction, but I'm so sorry about that Shankar Nitrala out there. But she has been trained from UCLA and she's a director of academics of Shankar Dev Nitrala and also the head of Ocular Plastics. And uh, she has a lot of feathers on her cap and a multi award winner uh, faculty. So aging is a fact of life and looking your age is not is what I always tell. So if you look at our faces, if you just focus on our own faces and if we see it over the years, right from our teenage to what we are in our 30s, 40s and 50s, we all age eventually. So you cannot really stop it. But what we can actually hold on to or do it is to kind of make it better or a better version of ourselves as we are aging in this process. If you look at our faces, they're divided into upper, middle, and lower faces. There are uh, the uh, demarcations which start from your forehead to the glabula, glabula to the lower part of your nose, and from nose to the chin area. So we are not going to cover a lot about mid face and lower face because uh, that itself is a big cause. But we will be focusing what is more important for ophthalmologists and oculoplastic surgeons, which is the upper face and the periocular area in terms of both surgical and non-surgical methods. Now, I'm just going to combine the aging trigger points and consultation together because, you know, usually what is happening in our clinics is that we are treating a condition or a line or a, or a deformity. We are not looking at it in a very holistic manner, right? So if somebody walks in and says, I need Botox, just a common thing for, let's say, smile lines, we'll just go and Botox it without looking at how the actually the face is present, what are the other things which are happening on the face. So I always believe in the holistic approach because once you have a holistic approach towards the face, you have a better understanding of what's happening. Now you need to look at not only the condition but also understand where the patient is coming from. And this question should come out from the patient. Uh, so for example, if we ask a leading question of how young you are or how old you are, and then the second leading question could be, how old do you think you are looking, right? Because uh, I may find the X person looking certain age, and age is just a number we understand, but this kind of relates to the patient in a very, very, uh, you know, in a very, what do you say, in a very psychological manner, because the moment you say you're 40 or 50, that's just an alarm going up and patients don't take it very well. So you need to understand the chronological age, but the more important thing is how do you feel inside? What, do we, what is the emotion going on inside? And at what age do you consider you look or felt the best? Because some people say, I look the best in 40s and I don't look good now. Or maybe I was good in 20s and I now look good. And for me, I think 40s is the best age for me myself because I think I'm enjoying my 40s. So it is, it is the way you actually start the conversation with your patient instead of just jumping and isolating a condition and treating it. Of course, the science always backs it up. We also need to understand the... Uh, you know, the lifestyles, the intrinsic and extrinsic factors which are affecting that particular individual. When I say intrinsic, this is all about the DNA, the genes, you know, the, the chronological aging which is happening. Extrinsic is all about epigenetics. So epigenetics is nothing but your, an, your environment. What kind of food are you in? What kind of thought process are you living in? What is your job profile? How are you taking care of yourself? 
because we all know that aging also is a major part of your aging process is your stress which is it is mental or physical apart from the you know the scientific aging or the uh, the obvious aging which has to happen so it is very important to understand the health markers now these are some of the health markers which we have to always ask now in my introduction i all i talked about i love being beautiful and healthy i need to i i love doing exercises and i'm a plant based individual now why did i say that because those are the two elements i feel are keeping my uh, free radicals away so every individual will have their own lifestyle their own health markers so some of the common ones is are you suffering from any kind of diseases do you have any hormonal imbalances what is your intake of alcohol smoking exercises what kind of diet are you on so these become a very very important part of the whole ecosystem of the aging which of course affects your age and especially around your eyes we all know that the face is divided into various aesthetic units uh, we are not going to go into detail of it welcome dr kasturi um so we just started okay um so we're not going to go into the detail of each and every aesthetic unit but the way we look at the whole face in totality is what kind of lines are there what kind of folds are there what is the skin quality now as eye surgeons and oculoplastic surgeons we often forget about the skin quality believe me if you make a skin of a person beautiful half of your aging process is actually taken away so aging trigger points happen to everybody this is me like uh, probably 3 years back when my face had actually plumped up for two reasons one i had put on you know around 10 kgs and second the aging process was very obvious so the oval shape was actually converting into the square face so we have the soft tissue trigger points and the bone uh, you know bony trigger points and this has been designed by a scientist called dr morisho de mayo and it's not important to kind of mug it up and understand what's happening it's just a concept which you need to understand so there are different points which have been labeled on the face and there are different color codings now color coding as we know the red yellow and green so green is where you're okay you can monitor the process yellow is where you need to intervene and red is where you have to treat so if i look at my face i fall in the yellow zone because now the aging if you can just look at my face even without looking at the points you can see the aging the soft tissue is descending the bony points are actually descending so i'm in the yellow zone where i need to start treating if i don't do that i'm actually progressing my aging and if i treat that i'm actually delaying my aging process or holding the tissues where they are right so this is the importance of intervening at the right time with the patient so what does it help in it helps in early detection and uh, diagnosis treatment it as, as i said delays aging and it also decreases the severity as i mentioned so if you start early now there is a misconception that if i do for example injectables or surgical procedure will my face look worse if i do a skin care treatment will my face look worse if i stop it so i always say that if you exercise and stop it will you look worse or better or would you like to do more exercise or not do it right so same is with your aesthetic procedures or any cosmetic treatments that it does not make you look worse if you stop it you you come back or bounce back to where you are but it's up to you how you want to take it forward combining your intrinsic and in extrinsic factors which is a very very important so always a holistic approach in consultation i think uh, i will just ask a question how much time do we actually spend let's say a patient comes for blepharoplasty how much time do you actually spend with your patient in the consultation room So five minutes is like cataract surgery. Like you see the torch cataract, you take the patient, operate and done and dusted. But in aesthetics, you have to form the rapport with the patient. It becomes part of your family. It's like a member of a family who's not feeling well, and you have to make them feel well. So the treatment is one part of it, and making them comfortable in their skin is another part of it. So you kind of walk the journey with them. So at least forty to forty-five minutes to an hour is what we assign. Uh, officially for our consultations you have to talk to the patients you know you have to talk around the condition you may not talk and say oh you know what you have eye bags let me correct it you would say okay so what do you do where do you come from what is your history you know that's why i was talking about the intrinsic extrinsic character the whole ecosystem around a patient and you will not believe it this is my personal experience in last 7 8 years is that each individual who's coming for a treatment is actually suffering from something deep within 
and you are an individual to actually correct it and make it better. So you're not only correcting the structural deformity, which is easy to do it, but you're actually giving another, you know, emotional uh, upliftment to that patient. So look at the emotions around it, the, you know, uh, whether the patient is happy, sad, you know, says I'm sagging or I'm looking, because today's generation of clients would not come and say, you know what, I have dark circles. They'll say, you know, everybody tells me that I'm looking sad, tired, dull, or maybe people think I drink a lot. So these are the factors which should come in. So you're going to talk it around. And then of course you have to back it up with your scientific knowledge where you're going to. So while you're doing this, you're at the back of it, you're actually analyzing it scientifically. You're looking at the aesthetic units. You're looking at the structure. You're planning the plan of action for them, which has to be given to the patient. And I always say that never give up on the cosmetic patients because if not today, they're going to come back to you after three months, six months, and even a year. They're never going to forget you. And if your consultation is good, they'll always be your patients. They're never going to forget you. They will come to you. A word on the aging process, I think everybody knows about it, that as we age, we deflate. So yes, raisins are more healthier than um, grapes, but everybody likes grapes. So we have to re-inflate we have to rebuild, re-restore, and rebuild the whole facial structure. So the concept of just cutting and making it okay is not okay. We have to actually build the whole pillar back where it exists. And that's what me and Dr. Kasturi will be talking to you about the various modalities of how we do it. Okay, so this was me. Uh, this was taken last year. Uh, my video is not working here. Working. Oh, it started. No, it's not there. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, the first two pictures. Sorry. So, you know, you you always analyze your faces. So this was me. Uh, like, I just got up from the bed. I was recovering from a surgical procedure, and I just wanted to see how am I looking. And always when you look down, so when you look straight, you look a certain way. When you look up, you look a certain way. And when you look down, you look a certain way. So when you look up, you're against the gravity and you always look good. So you must have seen all the, you know, when you want to have a good picture, you always actually raise your face or turn it to the side because you're going, you know, um, against the gravity and you're kind of asking the features to fall back. But when you look down is where your aging process actually happens. Why am I showing this to you is basically because you need to understand before you touch the patient in all gazes, the straight down and up where the aging process actually lies. Because in a static manner, I may be having grade two nasolabial folds, but when I'm looking down, actually my cheek is falling down. So this is how you plan your actions. And this is my husband who was courteous enough to uh, give his picture. Now why I took it? Because this is the time when he lost around 15 kgs. And I wanted to see how his facial structures have actually changed. Now you look at it, suddenly you see the mid face and the lower lids are looking hollow, right? And that's where we lose the fat maximum. And of course, the dynamicity of the muscles, you know, wrinkles, everything comes. Uh, so you need to analyze. So if you put on weight, the fat content is going up, your muscles are getting anchored better. And that's why everybody says you're looking better. And when you lose weight, everything sags down. So that doesn't mean you're not looking better, but you have to work on your tissues in a different manner. So there are different tools, which is injectable surgeries and others. I will be covering about the upper face and Dr. Kasturi will be taking you over on the lower face. So I always believe in the P's, which is your patient product, protocols, procedure, physician, as I said, patients, and of course, a practice and training. Let's talk about patients. Who are your right patients to deal with or take treatments for? So according to me, everybody, okay? There are some contraindications and red flags, but you know, anybody and everybody who walks in is your client and patient whom you can give something. You have to tailor made the procedure according to what they're suffering from. Who cannot? Of course, somebody who's suffering from certain disorders based on what you're planning to do, but somebody who has unrealistic expectations and we have a, you know, a set of, you know, rules where we understand that this patient does not have a realistic expectations. 
and of course for me evolution of being beautiful i mean if somebody doesn't want to be groomed i don't want to look the way they want to be then of course if they're just doing for somebody else and just for time pass they have come and want to test and try what they want to do again becomes a red flag for you because these patients are not going to be the good spokesperson of your treatment so it's very important to understand what kind of clientele you're dealing with I'm going to divide my talk into non-surgical, which is injectables, and then to the surgical methodology. So, of course, the injectables are the fillers and botulinum toxin. We have type A, type B, and type A is what we give for our cosmetic treatments. There are different brands out there in the market, uh, uh, different companies who are supplying. Uh, you know, we have two or three companies now in India who are supplying. So, based on your experience, your expertise, and your kind of training background, you can choose the product which is there. But always remember, type A is for your cosmetic indications. Type B is mainly for the you know uh, patients who had developed a resistance to type A. I wouldn't use the word resistant, but they are forming the uh, new uh, the, uh, uh, the the neurotransmitter junctions faster than a normal individual. You jump to type B or for the functional indications. The law of biologics is what I want to make you understand is that. Uh, how does one Botox differ from other? So we are talking about Botox here. So as you have different, so your milk product or your alcohol is the same, but how you mix it and how you produce it is what the outcome would be. The product will differ accordingly. So similarly, how the company is producing and processing the product is what the end product would be in your hands. So it doesn't mean that the Allergan Botox is better than Disport or Disport is better than any Indian make. You need to understand the signs of pharmacology, the systems and processes, and what works best in your practice, and then take it forward. So the law of biologics holds true for all the kinds of pharmacological agents which are using mainly the injectables, which is botulinum toxin and uh, hyaluronic acid fillers. So these are some of the standard recommend, uh, recommendations for the reconstitution of botulinum toxin. Uh, so when we are reconstituting, uh, we, we use a normal saline. Whether we use the preserved or non-preserved doesn't matter. Uh, it is, it, studies have shown it's just one of the same. And you reconstitute and this, the company says that you have to use the vial on the same day. But our personal experiences and recent studies have now shown that up to four to six weeks, you can keep it in the refrigerator at the temperature which is recommended and you can actually use it. Hyaluronic acid, again, there are different companies. Uh, I'm not labeling the companies here because I don't have any financial interest in that. But you have different companies with different products. And I think in the next five years, the Indian market is going to be flooded with different kinds of hyaluronic acid fillers. But the main crux of it is how does it work is that it actually binds with your extracellular matrix. It absorbs the water and plumps the tissue. So to make it clear, botulinum toxin is to soften the dynamic lines or the muscle action. And the hyaluronic acid is to plump it up. That means it's correcting the folds or the, uh, you know, the ligaments which have become loose. Protocols and preparation in terms of injectables, like any other thing, make sure your tools are with you. Make sure you talk to the patient, you take the consent, you document what you are doing. Now, there are certain con concepts for us which need to understand. First of all, uh, everybody wants to inject. Everybody wants to be an injector for Botox and fillers, but please don't do it unless the anatomy is very, very clear. So understand the facial anatomy in detail. You can have courses to do that. You can have books to read it. You can do cadaver dissections to understand it. But it's very, very important to understand where you are injecting, what you're injecting, what is the depth before you actually jump into the injections because especially for the fillers, there is no zone on the face which is safe because our face is a vascular structure. So you cannot land up injecting the filler in the vessel and land up with complications. So it's very important. Of course, we understand from our teachings that all the grooves on the face have the major vessels. So when we are injecting into the nasolabial folds, because that's a common indication which people walk in for, you need to understand your facial artery sits there. As I mentioned in the beginning, skin. If your skin barrier is not strong, if the patient is suffering from any kind of breakouts, herpes, or any kind of inflammation on the skin, please stop by because skin is the barrier to stop any kind of infection. So if somebody has a herpetic infection, wait for at least six to eight weeks. Somebody has allergic reaction, wait for six to eight weeks. And then you can go ahead and do your uh, fillers. In botulinum toxin, it is not so uh, uh, important, but definitely in fillers. 
never inject into the intramuscular plane because these are the metabolic vascular tissues. So, uh, you know, you have vessels, it's a vascular tissue, so you can land up into complications. The concept of myomodulation where you inject a thin layer over the muscle to kind of, you know, paralyze the muscle is there, but beware of injecting into the intramuscular plane. Also, this is often asked, what is the right dose to inject fillers? Now, remember, we have lymphatics. The hyaluronic acid is drained out and digested by the lymphatics. So the maximum is around 15 mil, which you can give at a time in the body for it to be digested. So always divide your doses. Okay, so there's a concept, especially you must be looking around in the Bollywood circle now. The, all the faces are actually really plumped up. So that's a new concept which has come up of apple cheek and, you know, whatnot. But I think the lesser is better. Go in a very, very natural way is what we believe in. But yes, at the end of it, it depends what your patient is asking for. But at a sitting, more, not more than 10 to 15 mil is what I would recommend. Any systemic disorder, if the patient is suffering from, please let it heal because you can have septicemias and you can have delayed hypersensitivity reactions. You can have uh, reactions because at the end of it, filler is an FDA approved device now. It's no more an element which you're injecting. Okay, so what are the basic complications which can happen with fillers? I'm just giving an overview and not scaring you away, but you can have uh, acute and delayed complications. In acute, you have the infections, the reactions, the hematomas, and in delayed, you can have the inflammation and hypersensitivity as I was talking about. Now, if you have assessed your patient in totality, if you've taken care of all the red flags, all the concepts, these are rare, but if it happens, then you have to treat it to the earliest. So the way you treat it is you assess the condition, make out whether it is an inflammation or an infection, if it is an inflammation, it settles down usually with the you know, oral steroids and antihistaminics and a course of antibiotics in terms of doxycycline. But if it is more than that, you may have to dissolve the product. And the worst complication is actually blindness, which can happen. And rare, but yeah, okay, there are cases where blindness have happened, especially injecting. I'll show you the picture where the maximum number of cases has happened. So when you're starting your injection practice, make sure that you're not injecting in the red zones or the advanced injection sites, because even in the hands of best of injectors, this can happen. So these are the red areas. So your glabella, your nasolabial, actually nasolabial is one of the most dangerous areas to inject because of the facial artery being there, glabella and the temples. These are the main areas where you need to stay away in the beginning of your practices. As you get advanced, yes, you can inject it with a lot of precautions. Uh, tear trough deformity, which is the most common thing which the ophthalmologists and oculoplastic surgeons see in their practice, is actually a good area to inject, provided you know where you're injecting. So people often get scared of tear trough deformity, but I think as eye surgeons, that's the area where we should be the most confident. Now, if you understand where your angular vein, angular artery is sitting and you inject on the bone where it is supposed to be, it is a safe area to inject. Now, the concept again, uh, I'm just covering the common things which I'm, you know, understanding is important to uh, put across. So when you're injecting the forehead, uh, so the one rule is that never, never over inject, always do less. You can always call the patient back and inject more. And you have to maintain the circle of diffusion. You stay away at least one centimeter above the brow area so that you don't bring the Botox down and cause the brow ptosis. So stay one centimeter above and inject in the square where the maximum muscle action is actually present. Because your frontalis is actually coming and sitting onto the brow. And if you come too low, then you can actually cause the brow ptosis. A word on corrugators, you have a deep head and a superficial head. So on the superficial head, which is around the tail here on the brow, you always inject superficial. And if you go deeper here, that's where you can actually cause doses because the product can actually go down. Crow's feet. Again, there is a tendency to overtreat crow's feet because people don't want even a single line, right? That is number one. Number two, you need to understand where the orbicularis is ending and where the zygomaticus major is starting. So if you're knocking out the zygomaticus major in cosmetic patients, that's where you will have a fake smile because the muscle recruitment happened. But if you want to do it for your hemifacials and blepharospasm, that's fine because you have to knock out the zygomaticus major. So if you look at this picture here, this is your zygomaticus major. 
coming in the corner of the mouth and this is where your orbicularis is so that's the junction here where you have to be very very careful while injecting so you always stay lateral away from the orbital rim and always look at the muscle action and then inject okay we'll show the pictures later but that's the red flag which you're not supposed to do these are some of the dissections to show how the facial artery is actually sitting its course you know that's why the nasolabial folds you can actually inject into the vessel this is your uh, communication with the angular artery and there can be actually intercommunication at the L of at the base of the nose so you can have bilateral blindness if you by chance inject into that but always remember your angular artery is too lateral because we all have been doing DCRs we know where the angular vein sits so it's a good idea to get the hold of the anatomy and not to get too scared about the tear turf deformities so you just need to understand that a word on physician i think what you have to understand is uh, when you are injecting or starting your practices that no matter what happens you are responsible for anything which happens to the patients now the case on the left side was a case injected by me during a training uh, program this patient came to me after a year with the full face swelling so this was a case of delayed hypersensitivity reaction now during trainings we don't take so much of history and this happened and this was a teaching lesson for me that this lady actually uh, had taken fillers before nothing had happened now after a you know she took the repeat fillers after a year and after a year of the repeat injection she got a delayed hypersensitivity so she has a history of four years and later we came to know that she had a history of uveitis right so she is prone for the inflammatory or hypersensitivity reactions so you need to understand your patient select your patient properly and then inject so these are the cases of immediate and delayed hypersensitivity reactions they do settle with medical treatments you may have to dissolve the product then where you are injecting so this was a patient injected for tear turf deformity and you can see the lumps and nodules all over along the lower eyelid so the product was wrong product superficial plane and you know uh, not done well so this kind of complications when they happen uh, you have to do nothing but dissolve the product let the patient be okay with it and go ahead counsel the patient and re-inject okay so this was a little bit an overview of the injectables and we can go into detail later now I'm coming to the forehead and brows as the aesthetic unit uh, so always understand that eyelids eyebrows and forehead they work as a unit in a very seesaw manner so for example if you have a forehead ptosis your brows are going to come down if your brows are up your lids are okay if your brows are down your lids are not okay so again don't treat the structure individually but look at it in a very holistic and in a unit manner of course the position of your brows will tell you about the emotional factor on the face the way our brows are if somebody has a nice arched brow you are surprised or if they are you know dull uh, they're low sitting or they are not aligned properly you may think that the patient or the person is tired or angry or sad so it kind of tells you about the expression on the face and i always believe that if your eyebrows and your lips are taken care of 50 percent of your aesthetic work is actually done so if your brows is in position your eyelashes and eyelid upper eyelid is taken care of, and your you know lips are taken care of even if the patient doesn't want to do anything you have done at least 50 percent of the job so yes the anatomy again is very very important this is a triangle where you have the medial and the lateral brow uh, you know it is at angle with the medial canthal and the slant along the lateral canthi but these are just the base marks because with individuals the things can change you can have flatter brows in men uh, in women and you can even have arched brows in men so you need to understand the ethnicity and the facial structures where they are coming from so some of the uh, uh, surgical you know the results which we had of non surgical handling of the brow position so here is a patient who has the angry lines or the frown lines and this is after the botox where we were given 220 units of botox in the glabella another patient so what i want you to bring to it what i want to bring your attention to is the change in the facial expression so the same patient when they are frowning yes the lines have gone by but it is more of the expression which has changed for the patient similarly here again the surprise lines or the forehead lines we can inject and make them ironed out with botulinum toxin you can do the chemical brow lift we can you can arch the brow now a word of caution here you cannot lift the brow with bot botox and fillers you can arch it and support it 
if the brow ptosis is moderate to severe you have to do a surgical intervention you have to lift it up but if somebody is looking for shaping for example if i look at my brows they're very much in position if i want to arch it i will just play around with fillers and botox or maybe threads but if somebody has a droopy brow and already has a massive frontalis action to raise it up you have to actually surgically correct it smile lines as i was saying don't chase them see this individual again has some smile lines available in men of course you need to leave some smile lines you cannot knock them out completely this is a case where a uh, patient is with the prosthetic shell uh, in the in the left eye she had an inherent uh, you know tendency to lift her brow up so the frontalis was acting overacting and this is what we did and interplayed with the superior sulcus fillers and the brow for the frontalis and brought it together for her to look symmetrical in the normal eye she is esotropic and myopic this is another case where we combined the upper lid blepharoplasty with the uh, brow lift so there was an internal brow lift with the blepharoplasty now look at the brows these are tattooed brows so she doesn't have a very good brows so if i want to enhance her features more i would work on her brows more than what is done here another individual where the brow positions are not symmetrical so we bring it in place playing around with the upper eyelid blepharoplasty procedures and the brow here the combination of um, internal brow lift with the blepharoplasty was done a patient who walked in for entropion actually had a forehead ptosis you can look at where her brows are actually sitting so we went ahead, went ahead and did a mid forehead lift for her corrected her entropion did a bit of a blepharoplasty and this is how the patient is and later on we also did little bit of botox on her forehead to just relax her frontalis muscle not for cosmetic reasons but for functional reasons this is a patient where the external brow lift was done so you can see the scar on this corner oh the arrow has gone up but the scar is here and these scars actually heal beautifully uh, uh, and we we always used to be scared to do the external uh, external uh, brow lift but now we have seen that if you actually go layer by layer and you do your st stitching well even in women the scars are healing very well so external brow lift is is a very very good tool to do another individual where was a traumatic brow ptosis and we went ahead and did an internal brow lift so you can see the line the red line the brow is lower on the pre case and it is on the same on the post case this is a lady where we did a lower lid blepharoplasty with skin care with brow lift uh, you can see the change in the texture of her skin the brows are looking more symmetrical and aligned in the position there is no arching or lifting of the brows it's just there where they are supposed to be she is a 60 year old lady Brow lid wrinkling has gone down. The skin texture is improved, and patient is uh, doing pretty well. Uh, this is a case where we did the brow lift with the threads. Uh, so if you look at the pre picture, the brows are not symmetrical. One is up and down, and with the threads we could actually bring it to the same level, align it, and give it a little arch because she's a younger patient. Of course, uh, in upper lids we need to understand whether it is a brow ptosis, it is a blepharoplasty case, or a ptosis. Now I'm not going to cover the ptosis because if it's a ptosis, just correct it. But you need to understand the hooding of upper lids is happening because of your brow ptosis, forehead ptosis, upper eyelid skin, or even the lacrimal gland prolapse. So this was an individual with a huge lacrimal gland prolapse, which was corrected. Blepharoplasties, yes, uh, is a very, very important uh, topic, and we can excise any amount of skin, realign any amount of skin, redistribute any amount of skin based on uh, what kind of lid tissue is there, whether it is coming, what part of the India or the country it is coming from, and you can give various results depending upon what the patient is looking out for. There can be patients with asymmetrical lid creases, patients with asymmetrical lid skin, which can be aligned. So this patient had heavy eyelids. Again, uh, this is only after a week or 10 days of surgery. And what they are just looking for is the freshness, the openness in the eyes, and not to make them look something beyond their ages. Again, the same case where the hooding was there. And we have just removed and aligned the hooding of upper eyelid skin. Another individual uh, who had a very, very lax skin. And we just did a minimalistic upper lid blepharoplasty to make it better. So some of the rules of upper lid blepharoplasty is the marking. You have to spend a lot of time in marking because you have to understand whether it's a single lid crease, the multiple lid creases. The lateral lid crease actually stops at the lateral canthi and you have to be five millimeter above. The lower margin and the upper is maximum 10. 
we cannot excise more than uh, you know eight to ten millimeters of skin because you need to be um, you need to have at least 18 to 20 millimeters of uh, skin remaining. I don't know why this video is not working, but what it showed was a case where I was marking it and then suddenly I realized there was another skin fold happening and then I had to realign it. I don't know why it is not working, but I don't know. Okay, we'll miss it out. So this is how a typical skin marking would be done. So you uh, spend a lot of time, I mean, you know, the training where I went to, uh, the skin marking itself was 20 minutes procedure and the blepharoplasty was just 20 minutes. So that's the amount of time you have to spend on the skin marking. Of course, with experience, you can be faster. So you always take a lateral flange. You take a longer lateral flange if you have a brow ptosis because that helps to lift the lateral end of the brow because you're excising a part of an orbicular is there. So you mark your litteries, make it symmetrical, pinch the, do the pinch skin test. You can even measure it beforehand and make sure around 18 to 20 millimeters of skin, which is required for the normal lid closure is always present. And based on the shape of the eyelid, based on where the patient is coming from, what is the structure of the eyelid, you can actually create the shape. It's not always possible that you will have a crescentic cut to the upper eyelid skin. It varies from patient to patient. So this is around the 20 millimeter skin, which we are talking about. So after you have done that, uh, I am a big fan of RF cautery uh, with the Colorado tip, but you can have your own blades and scissors to do it. But if your energy parameters are good, it does not cause any coagulation, pigmentation or any kind of post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. So I've been doing it and I like it. Uh, but yes, it's an individual choice. Um, so this is a skin alone excision where we are just removing a pinch of skin because the patient didn't have too much of orbicularis hanging. But if the patient has heavy eyelids, you will also remove the strip of the orbicularis muscle. And this is at the end of it where once you have excised the skin, you can uh, take the continuous sutures or interrupted sutures. Continuous sutures are always better because in one go you can take it and remove it at the end of it. You can even take subcuticular sutures uh, which are absolutely fine. Again, it's the individual choice. So, uh, uh, we, you know, this was a patient where I was talking about the uh, internal brow lift. I don't know why these are not working. Anyways, so the internal brow lift surgery uh, was done in this individual and we go from the lid crease along the blepharoplasty incision, go up to the brow area and anchor the brow, the sub-brow fat to the orbital rim where it is supposed to be. Okay, so this is the mid-forehead. Uh, how we use the mid-forehead is you use the lines and righties which are already present in an individual. So you have to be very, very careful to assign and understand where you want to take your crescents. In men, it is easier. In women, it is more trickier. So you create those crescents and see how much lift you want. You can simulate that amount of brow lift and the excision is very simple. Once you have aligned and marked your creases well, it's just the skin and orbicular, uh, the frontalis muscle which you have to excise. The key here is that you have to bevel your incision so that when you're, anchor when you're suturing it back, it actually overlays itself and the wound is not depressed. So you bevel it, then you excise your skin and the uh, frontalis muscle. And once it is done, you can anchor it to the periosteum and suture it. This is a word on the external brow lift where it can be an isolated lateral one third or a full range and the same concept. Now, these are some of the markings which I wanted to show you for the Botox injections. There are different methodologies to do it, but always plan where you want to inject. So you don't want to cross the lateral brow area because that's where you don't, you know, your frontalis is minimally acting. Ask the patient to animate it, show the maximal muscle strength, both for your glabella and frontalis. See, there are consensus for the maximum doses which can be given. So for example, on the forehead, the maximum men you can give is 13, women it's 20. But you can always, you know, go overboard or less based on the width of the forehead, the muscle action and where the patient is coming from. So you can divide your dosages. Always remember the circle of diffusion is around 1.3 to 1.5. So you always give a gap of one centi uh, you know, a circle, a finger width apart when you're injecting. Okay, so this is uh, how the crow's feet can be injected. So you stay away from the lateral orbital margin and from one side only, you can inject on both sides, say subcutaneous. 
don't go into the deeper plane in the orbicularis area because your muscle is just lying below so this is the point which i wanted to show that this is the point we land up injecting when we are doing the aesthetic and this is where the zygomaticus major fibers are actually going to walk in okay so uh, this is the patient whom i did the upper eyelid fillers uh, she's with a prosthetic shell again a superior sulcus deformity underwent surgery and had a little bit of lid retraction around with it so you just fill the superior sulcus deformity with the ha fillers and the results as i shown you in the previous picture can happen now these are easy injections because you're going to be into the suborbicularis plane preceptal sometimes you may have to hit the superior orbital rim if the sulcus deformity is very deep you can actually hit the superior orbital rim and give small ellicots there to give that fullness and it gives beautiful results this is about your glabella and procerus so procerus you always pinch the muscle feel the full width and depth of the muscle and then inject because this is the area where you can go deeper and inject okay so don't be shy enough to go deeper into the procerus the forehead you have to inject into the intramuscular plane because if you go deeper you're going to hurt the patient if you're going to be superficial you're not working on the muscle so you can divide understand the way muscle action is maximum and inject accordingly okay so a word on the spock deformity which can happen so this is the same individual whom we injected and if you see he's when he's raising his brow the right brow is actually spocking right it's not very nice feature because the patient may look look little crooked may look little not so good okay so what we do for the spock deformity is wherever the spock is maximum we ask the patient to animate see there is a recruitment of the frontalis muscle happening there mark those points and just give one one unit there to relax that frontalis and the muscle comes down so this is very common which can happen it can happen in best of the hands because when you're working on the frontalis sometimes the lateral end of the frontalis may not have been injected well and the spock deformity can actually happen okay so this is the threads uh, for the brow lift so we have started doing now a lot of threads where we are doing the mid face lifts we are doing the low face lifts the necks and the brows for brows it works beautifully well uh, in addition to your fillers botox and surgical methods this is another alternative but you need to actually select your patient well before you do it it is minimally invasive it is not in as invasive as surgery but it is not as less invasive as botox or fillers but patients understand that so if you kind of combine all these treatment modalities you can actually reshape and rebuild the face the way you want to for an individual you can change the expressions around the faces playing around with your surgical methods non surgical methodologies thank you very much um so now i invite dr kasturi uh, for those who were not in the hall i'll just reintroduce her uh, she doesn't need any introduction but thank you so much ma'am for being part of my course and uh, uh, none better than her to cover the lower part of the face uh, so dr kasturi is the director academic shankadev netralaya she's been trained at shankadev netralaya and the ucla and uh, she's also recently got her degree from the harvard business school um uh, and she is a multiple awardee and a very very prominent face so over to you ma'am a very good morning to all of you and after the beautiful lecture by dr shubra she has covered so well the whole of the upper part of the face so i'll be covering basically the lower part of the face and i'll just uh, stick to some of the basic principles of the lower part of the face so so no financial interest so let me start i always like to mention shubra has already shown so well that facial aging when we say we'll find both hyper and a hypo many of times we find there's loss of soft tissue as you can see here in certain parts of the face and also the hypertrophy of the fat in certain part of the face especially the jaws but being ophthalmologist what she has mentioned it's very important that we know how to do a tear trough and this tear trough when i define as this tear trough it is basically a combination of hill and the valley and this has led to so many classification 
if you don't mind please don't take any video photograph because these are all my aesthetic patients sorry so so this has led to the combination of the hills and the valleys and when we classify it the very easy way type 1 is a hill that means you have a bulge of the fat coming type 2 when you have a trough type 3 is a combination of the hill and the valley type 4 when you have a double bulge and a double trough which is very common in very very elderly people and a type 5 when you have a mixture of this but what we also believed uh, recently the pain classification which i really appreciate this is also on the ba this is also based on the theory of hyper and the hypo along with the aging changes which are classified based on the atrophy the bulging and the laxity so what is this tear trough if you look to this tear trough this is basically a separation of the orbicularis muscle so we know that in the lower lid the orbicularis has one the palpable part and one is the orbital part so when this separates this leads to the prominence of the tear trough ligament and this leads to the trough so this is what we call the true tear trough when there's actual separation of the palpable part of the orbicularis from the orbital part of the orbicularis and there's something known as i have seen in many of the presentation actually these are all nasojugal folds which are being many times presented at the tear trough which is basically the separation of the orbital if, if you look this is the orbit when there's a separation of the orbital muscle from the quadrate group of muscle what shubra was mentioning very well with the quadrate group of muscle which is actually lifts the face if you look to the face nicely this part of the face is a lifter right and this part is a depressor again the mid part is a lifter and the lower part is a depressor so these are the sad group of muscle these are the happy group of muscle this is basically a sad group of muscle because it closes everything and this is again a happy group of muscle so this is what a difference you should know what is the difference between a correct and the inter indirect tear trough and because of all these hills and valleys that i have mentioned you'll see that there are so many grooves there's a cheek deformity there's festoons and all the other changes coming up so there are multiple factors which accounts for the multi contour changes in the tear trough one is the depth of the tear trough that is the distance from the anterior lacrimal crest to the depth of the trough one is hyperpigmentation in indian skin we get lots of hyperpigmentation this gives us an illusion of the depth it is not that there is a prominent tear trough but it gives an illusion because of shadowing effect we have a very prominent brow so it leaves a shadowing effect and gives us an illusion of the depth as you can see in this lady third is a prolapse of the nasal fat itself leads to the prominence of the tear trough and along with the aging changes that we can see here so on this combination of all this the uh, prolapse of the fat the trough itself the hyperpigmentation and the changes in the skin it leads to the prominence of the tear trough so i always believe that this trough or the aging change is because of the hypertrophy and hypotrophy of one or the other group of muscle and this is best balanced by the injection dermal filler Shubha has very nicely mentioned that there are different types of dermal fillers in the market. The reverse will, will, will not go much into it because all of us prefer the natural source and this is basically the hyaluronic acid. But what is new today? I feel that the whole scenario will be changed and which I strongly believe is the biofiller. So this biofiller which is very, I mean very important because this is your own autologous tissue and the chances of any immunogenic reaction is less which can be in the form of a liquid biofiller or a solid biofiller which I'll come to you. So there, there are different injection techniques like threading, depot, fanning but what are the patterns? One is the serial puncture and this serial puncture can be either integrate retrograde or it's a fanning which we usually do for the NLF, the nasolabial fold and the grid pattern which we usually do for the deep malar fat. So these are the different, I mean techniques but what I want to show is what is a, how do you inject. So previously and even now I feel this is a good technique where directly you inject in the trough pre-perioceal with a needle. So many people they believe this is a good and even I believe it is good in some patient. Only thing is that you might get the bruise or the lumps and bumps can occur because this is a very thin part we know the orbicularis part this is the thinnest skin in the body so there can be change cha cha i mean uh, some bruise or lumps and you just see the change see you can see the tear trough here this is not injected side and this is an injected side so on the table you see the changes on this table you'll see the concealing of the orbital fat on the table you'll see the i mean the concealment of the trough so these are some of the patient where she has a very prominent you can see there's a small fat bulge here 
and this is your post-operative as you can see here under the patient the hyper uh, hyperpigmentation looks less because of the shadowing effect has decreased and what I believe or what I practice 100% for my tear trough is the cannula so we need to differentiate between the fat and the fluid I'll come to you later and a very easy way is that you mark the inferior orbital rim approximately one to two millimeter below it you give another um, marking and you stay in between that plane so what you do you take a cannula usually a 25 gauge cannula and when you there are two types of cannula in the market make sure that the opening of the cannula is to the side so if it is to the side there's no chance of any vascular complication because the tip is always a blunt if the vessel is also being hit it will hit the the blunt tip will hit so the opening should be at the side so you should be very sure when you buy these cannulas and then on the table you'll see difference and this is i think one or two days after the procedure so you can see this bulge you can see this prominence which vanishes after giving the injection filler another lady where you can change and see the changes not because the prilox was given on the table you can see the changes and you can see the conversion of this negative vector which i'll come to later to a positive vector you can see uh, post filler injection you can again see the small fat bulge here and also the trough and you can see the concealing of the fat and also the correction of the trough another gentleman this is on the table another gentleman you can see this is a fat and you can see the post filler concealing of the fat and also the correction and also what I want to show you this is under the lady you can see the fat here this you can see the cannula mark these are all changes on the table where you can see the fat gets concealed and also the correction of the trough many times we do loss of blepharoplasty people always think that blepharoplasty means you excise your skin excise your fat and whatever you want you excise this no you should go for titrated excision and especially now like after doing so many uh, cases like I have done approximately thousand blep I should say I have realized these are my, uh, my own patient where initially I had excised the fat but now we do not go for any excision what we do we preserve the fat and I always believe that the biofiller fat itself is something like a, a biofiller your own PRP is your biofiller your PRF is a biofiller this gives a much better result and you will not have any reaction the late immunogenic reaction that has been shown by Shubra so you see this is the same patient Indian skin so much of pigmentation and she was not liking the pigmentation and see the prominence of the orbital rim after my blepharoplasty so these are the patient you need to augment it these are um, which we call as a post blepharoplasty augmentation so they're best too when you go for the dermal fillers there are different types of depending on the g prime so in the mid phase we may use a higher g prime and you should always remember that this is just a unit it is not that you only treat the trough you need to lift this part of the cheek then only you can get the better correction so once you uh, do with the meat face and then you fill the trough that you want to um, that you have seen in this patient and these are the classical points which we call t1 t2 t3 that is the t1 is the central t2 uh, is the lateral and t3 is the medial so these are the points which say that they are dangerous but i feel it is not a danger zone because you hardly have any important bunches of the internal carotid over here so once you fill up the area you can see the changes as you can see this one pre-operatively before the blef this is after the blef and this is after the injection filler and then these are the changes you can see so beautifully this hollowness has been filled up and also the pigmentation looks much better you can see before and after the procedure and totally with so much of filler and the surgery being done she looks so pretty like she looks a daughter to herself so this is under the patient i have done the blepharoplasty she was very happy with the initial result this is how she looked after a few months and then five years later she comes to me with this look she's telling madam i'm not liking this hollowness especially when i animate there's so much of wrinkles so much of hollowness so what i had done i had also done the same procedure i have filled up all this hollowness and all the trough that has been created post blepharoplasty and once that has been done And you can see and this also this is what she you can see this has been filled up and even when she animates you can see in the skin and uh, this is not with botox this is without botox only with the filler because it is also causing some amount of myomodulation so there'll be lots of discussion uh, discussion today what is myomodulation will come to it but this really works like filler itself also can give you a botox effect 
sometimes my students, my juniors, they keep on asking, the, how do you manage? Because once we keep on injecting fillers, they get lots of adhesion. So how do you break the adhesion? The best way of breaking the adhesion is that you need to pinch it. Then you need to push the cannula, which really does a good abscission and you can uh, break up all the scar. So this is what you can see, the best way you just give a little pinch, not here, you'll see as the video goes forward, you make a pinch, do a abscission in such situation, and once you fill up that scar, the chances of again the, um, the scar coming back is very less. Now we say that along with the straff and bag that, that, that we have been mentioning, with the loss of changes in the periorbital region in the form of wrinkles, in the form of hyperpigmentation. So sometimes what we do, this is what we call a myomodulation. Sometimes what we do, we put filler just above the muscle. You should, have, should go very subdermal. Any filler above the muscle decreases the action of the muscle. Any filler below the muscle increases the action of the muscle. So it changes a vector force. This is very important. So this is what we call the my uh, myomodulation, where filler itself also can give a Botox effect and decrease the wrinkle, as you can see here. So what I want to share with you is something in very brief, and which I have also started, is the second generation biomaterial. And this is the PRF, which can be in the liquid form, which can be in the solid form. It gives an amazing result because it contains all the growth factor, whether it's a platelet-derived growth factor or the transforming growth factor or the VEGF or the endothelial growth factor and also the insulin growth factor. So it is a mesh of growth factor along with the platelets and the leukocytes, which can be you can have it both in the liquid and in the solid form. And we inject it into the skin because sometimes, you know, the thin, thin, the, uh, I mean, the periocular uh, changes is maximum, the aging changes. So you also need to rejuvenate the skin. So it can be done with a cannula or with a needle. So there are different studies which has validated this use. And they have found that it works very good for the bad textures, for all the spots, and also for the pores and the wrinkles. And this is something known as the Cleopatra technique, which people are doing which is a combination of this liquid PRF along with the solid PRF and this acts as a single step for the augmentation and for the skin rejuvenation. So along with all these changes in the lower lid, which I have already mentioned, the trough, the pigmentation, another problem is the bags. So how do we manage the bags or why these bags occur? This is because of some topographic changes in the skin and some topographic changes in the bone and which classically leads to the development of a negative vector from the positive vector. So a positive vector is when we have the malar plane much anterior to the corneal plane, we call it a positive, vec a positive vector, and with age, because of the resorption of the bone, the retusion of the maxilla, along with the skin changes, it leads to the negative vector where the malar line is much behind the corneal plane. And this, along with the different topographic changes that I'll be showing you, leads to all the aging change around the eye which can be in the form of the eye bags, in the form of the malar mounds and the fistula. It can be in the form of a double convex deformity which I call it a, already I have showed you the cervix classification that is a hill valley, hill valley. So every hill is causing a convex deformity so we call it a double convex deformity. And then you can have the horizontal lid laxity and also the dermatocolysis changes and also the teardrop changes. So along with this topographic skin changes, we have the bony changes. There are differential, uneven, site-specific bone resorption, which changes the pyramidal shape of the orbit to a mu much of a rectangular shape of the orbit. So how do we differentiate whether it's a fluid or it's a fat or is a combination of fluid or fat? You ask the patient to look straight and then ask the patient to look up. And if you feel that the fat has gone off totally, or if you see that there's some amount of fat still present, then it can be a um, fluid. So if you ask the patient to look straight and up, then it's ask the patient to look down. So if there's no fat, no more swelling, then it is a fat. But if you see some amount of swelling present, that means it has a fluid also. So in this way, you can differentiate whether it's a fat, fluid, or combination of the both. So when we have this fat prolapse, and when the level of the fat is much behind the anterior lacrimal crest, this other situation we go for dermal filler. Or another way of knowing how, in which situation you'll go for dermal filler, or which situation you'll go for the surgery. If the fat is just medial to the lateral cantal line, you can try with the dermal filler. 
But if you see all the three fat bags protruding and the fat goes beyond the lateral canthal line, these are the cases where you should consider for the surgery. So as you can see here, I don't know why this. Uh, so this cases, when in minimal cases, we go for injection dermal filler. But when you have a double convex deformity with the lengthening of the lid and the fat being prolapsed and the level of the fat is much anterior to the anterior lat lateral crest. So this are the situation we go for the lower lip blepharoplasty. And as we al already know, in the upper lid there are two fat beds, in the lower lid there are three fat beds. And we, in between the medial and the central, we have the inferior oblique muscle and between the central and the lateral, we have the arcuate expansion. And when you look to the animation out here, you see the central fat bed is much interior as compared to the medial and the lateral fat bed, which is much behind inside the orbit. So I usually prefer a transconjunctival approach. You can also go by the transcutaneous approach. Usually I give an injection over the three fat bed and then once it exposed, you can see this is a um, orbital septum, just make, make a nick on the orbital septum and take out the three fat bed. This three fat bed now will work as a filler. So from this prolapsed fat bed, you fashion the three fat pedicles because these pedicles will be having the blood supply and this becomes a viable filler for you. So this is an inferior oblique muscle that you can see, which is actually separating the medial from the central fat bed. And it's very important that you should delineate the muscle because if you injure this muscle, you will have the post-operative diplopia and it will be very troublesome for the patient. We know that inferior oblique is forgiving, but you cannot injure the muscle and leads to a diplopia. And these are the beautiful three fat pedicle. And this three fat, um, fat pedicle, now you need to transpose it. So where do you transpose it? You need to go beyond the soof in the mid malar plane. And we know here we have a vertical structure, which is an osseo cutaneous ligament, which is known as the orbitomalar ligament. So you need to release the ligament and then only you can transpose the orbital fat into the soap. There's always a debate, actually, do we have it or we do not have this ligament, but I have done the cadaveric dissection myself. It is actually present and it is known as a true ligament because it's an osseo cutaneous ligament. So, and this is the way you can use any suture. You can use a proline suture. I'm using a PDS because it's a monofilament and the tensile strength lasts for approximately three months and it gets absorbed by more by 180 days or so. So the proline, there's a PDS really helps you and this is how you go for the fat transposition in all the three uh, in the all the three fat beds and then you do not even have to put a bolster you just put a suture because it will get absorbed it's very inert non-reactive so this is how you um, pass the uh, fat without i mean sacrificing the fat you're using it as a biofiller you're using as your own autologous tissue and then and you go for the other side same procedure is done it, it depends whether you close the conjunctiva, but you should be very careful. At least give three sutures because it can lead to a post-operative simplephron. So this is some of the patient. You can see this is before and after the procedure that you can see here. A very good effacement of the late cheek junction. Another gentleman with a fat prolapse, you can see. The beauty is that you can see the change of the positive vector to a negative vector to a positive vector. So this is a very classical negative vector that you can see before the uh, procedure. And this negative vector got converted into a positive vector with a very good effacement of the late cheek junction. So these are some of the patient that you can see which uh, has undergone blepharoplasty. And the most important thing that you should see the how the lid and the cheek they behave. They cannot be, it should be a very plain, there should be a very nice effacement following the procedure if we use this fat transposition. Many a time we see that along with this, all this the uh, hill and the valley, you also find laxity of the canters. There are different ways of doing the lex uh, canter laxity management. This is the simplest and especially for the beginners, you can go for this way where you need to make an incision in the lower canter, uh, canters uh, ligament and then you use a double arm proline suture. Take a bite through the same hole and take it out to the arcus marginalis through the upper part, upper part of the lateral canthus. So this is a very, very simple way of doing it. And in a more advanced case, you'll have to do an external lateral canthoplasty where you need to make a hole, a drill, uh, a hole in the, I have a video, I don't know whether it is here or not. You may uh, drill a hole and then you need to go for the fixation of the lateral canthus. And the changes that you see before and after the procedure where he had undergone a low lip blepharoplasty. But what we see that one of the very common 
factor which is responsible for all these changes in the main phase is the gravity. We know everything comes down because of gravity, whether it's a bro, whether it's a lower lead, whether it's a mid phase or whether it's a full phase, it is a gravity which pulls down along with the laxity of the skin and the retrusion and also the bone resorption. So I really enjoyed reading this paper where you can see they had done a 3D photography on sitting and also in supine position. So when we sit, when we stand, because of gravity, everything pulls down and you can see the actual aging changes. But the same person, when you make him or her lie down in a supine position, there is no effect of gravity. So you will see the patient looks much younger. Like my daughter, like when I do a video call to her, when I sometimes she sleep and do, and she says, oh ma, you look so young. <laughs> it's because the effect of gravity is not there. But the moment you sit, everything will pull it down and you'll see the effect of gravity. So this is a very beautiful paper each of you can go through and you can see the photographic beautiful documentation. See this is in the supine position and this is in the sitting position. So I always feel in such patient where you have so much of stetoblepharon, so much of changes, you have to do some amount of some anti-gravity treatment. That means you have to work and you need to uh, against, work against the gravity and pull the muscle down. So this is a situation where you need to do a transcuteness. You can also do a trans uh, conjunctival approach, but the transcuteness becomes much easier, especially in the beginner. So the same procedure now you're doing from the external side. Like do, It's like doing a external DC versus a uh, endo DCR <coughs> so you make you make the three fat particles laterally I have excised it and then the transposer and this is just mass in the orbicularis <coughs> and you need to lift this mass in the orbicularis and switch at a much higher level and along with it also you can go for the correction of the lateral canthus <coughs> you can see the uh, pre and the post See how beautifully she has changed. <coughs> this is another patient that I'd like to show you. Where I have done a, <coughs> a trans conjunctival, <laughs> my voice is gone. <coughs> so a trans conjunctival approach has been done where a soof and a smash has been lifted by, and you can see this is an MNRF, which Shubra has already mentioned. So as we do a ACT practice, it is not only a complete treatment if you do only a Botox filler or blepharoplasty. You have to holistically treat the patient. You have to give them a good skin. So considering all these points from my own experience, I've started doing peeling for the patient. I've started doing PRP, MNRF, HIFU, everything I have started doing because you need to give a holistic treatment. We, the face is not a single unit. You, there are multiple units and you need to combine all these multiple units. <coughs> so I have done a MNRF here for her. And the same patient, what I have done, I have done an external broplasty, uh, endoscopic broplasty. And also I have harvested the flat, fat and the fat has been harvested from the thigh and I have gone for a skin rejuvenation and a uh, chin augmentation. I always be, uh, believe that whatever you have in the body, if it can be used, bring the hyper to the hypo region, I think it gives you much better. So then the, now the new concept is either you use a micro fat or a nano fat. Micro, especially for the augmentation and nano for the skin rejuvenation. So for the chin, many a times we use filler, but if I do any facelift or mid, mid facelift procedure, these are the situation where I prefer using either a micro fat for the augmentation, NLF and your chin, and also the nano fat for your skin. So this is very one week after the procedure. I think she is doing quite good. You can see all this swelling. This is because of the very major surgery, the mid face lift along with the forehead lift. <coughs> this is what I want to show you all. From my experience, when I started doing blepharoplasty with a bropexy, and when I go back to my own patient, I feel that the effect of blow, uh, blow pick C, it is very minimal. It stays maximum for two years, three years. So what I believe, you need to work on the gravity. So what this is a very nice way of doing where you give a small incision just behind the hairline. First, you try to separate the superficial temporalis fascia from the deep temporalis fascia. And this conjunct tendon, you need to see this conjunct tendon only if you release this conjunct tendon, then only you'll be able to pull the whole of the forehead and the brow. 
So this is after the lysis of the conjunct tendon. And then you can see the end point of your separation is when you see the superior orbital rim. And laterally, that is the superior um, uh, supraorbital nerve. So once you um, lyse it, the lyse laterally, the superficial from the deep temporal fascia, and medially you need to lyse the galea from the underlying uh, periosteum only when you dissect out the conjunct tendon. So this is how then you put a lifting suture, and it gives a <coughs> very beautiful bro lift. And this is the different threads that we use. And uh, this is a very minimal way of doing a non-surgical facelift. This is a cock thread that you can see. The cock thread really gives a very good lift. And along with it, we use an anti vector. You should always remember the thread should be when you use a mono thread or twin thread, it should be always anti vector. So these are the uh, twin thread that has been used in this patient. Same procedure done on the other side. And you see the you see this lift. The bro has been lifted so well. And this is also a very early procedure. So I feel that we as a oculoplastic surgeon, when we do a facial aesthetic procedure, we should have a thorough understanding of the enzyosomes of the face, what are the true enzyosomes, what are the choke, and the correlation of this internal carotid to the orbit. And we should have a thorough understanding of the blood vessel. But the most important is that we should realize that all the f um, uh, muscles of the facial expression are ultimately connected to the muscle of the ocular expression. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. Thank you, Dr. Kasuri, for a wonderful audiovisual uh, feast. So if you have any questions from the audience regarding both the talks or any procedures, please feel free to ask us. I just check, I think I have one more presentation. I think Shubra can take the question, or if any important, if you want, any one of you have any surgical questions, I'll be happy to answer. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Shubra ma'am, ma Kasturi ma'am, for the excellent talks. Uh, I have uh, two questions. Uh, ma'am, post, uh, yeah. ma post uh, fillers, how, uh, how many days the, does the swelling and the bumps and lumps would usually last, and how many days should we really observe the patient before uh, we plan to re-intervene or dissolve the product? See, one is that you get the instant lumps and bumps that you see it on the table. That also you try to mold, keep on, uh, and the best molding occurs within 48 hours. And you know, the molding is so important. Like, we do not give much importance, but molding is extremely important for filling up. So you wait for 24 hours, and sorry, 48 hours, and you can wait for maximum two weeks when you see it on the table. And w sometimes you see very late, which is an immunogenic reaction. Then too, you have to start with some low dose of oral steroids and you have to highly it. What about the uh, uh, facial uh, swelling which occurs post procedure, maybe a day and uh, 48 hours later? Nothing, it will go up. I always tell my patient, you look most like better after two weeks. Don't like try to judge what you're saying tomorrow, day after tomorrow, because it'll all imbibe water, it'll be leading to so much of hydration, so better you see yourself after two weeks. Okay. And regarding the PRF, ma'am, how much ml of the blood we really have to take to... That is something very interesting, I think, if, if you ask me, I can keep on talking it. PRP depends, like I take 20 cc of blood, and when you use the centrifuge machine, you should have two um, test tube. One will balance each other. Otherwise, always, even if you don't have, you should have a, what to say, mm, balancing test tube. If you take a 10 cc of the blood, then you say take another test tube, uh, empty test tube in the opposite direction. So a 10 cc will give you, when you centrifuge it, there, whether you want to have a PRP or a PRF. If you want to have a PRP, that means you need to centrifuge at 3000 RPM for approximately 20 to 30 minutes. If you want to have a PRF, then the centrifuge, uh, centrifuge approximately 800 to 1000 for approximately 10 minutes. So if you want to have a PRP, first when you go for the centrifuge fug uh, fugation, then you'll see below is the blood, RBC. Then you'll see the yellow color fluid. The top layer is PPP, platelet poor plasma. So you discard the top layer. So what you do, this is a test tube. If this is a test tube, you put the needle down. Just keep the needle above the blood, RBC. Then from there you withdraw so the top layer is not disturbed and you leave the top layer. So top, the two millimeter you discard it, that is PPP, it has got no work. 
so this prp that you will be using you can use for face you can use for hair it was excellent for hair thank you so much ma'am and uh, before I go, I'd like to mention that we have the midterm, the OPI midterm. It is in Aurangabad. Dr. Shubha, Shubha is here. She has done all the arrangement. I'm sure it will be a very grand success. And the topic this time is functional eyelid. And the new, new ways of doing how to manage the different functional indications of the lids will be discussed and all the videos will be shown. I invite all of you that please, please do join us on 3rd of July. It's a one-day program. It's on uh, Sunday. And some discounted registration is being given. It is near the El Argan booth in P1 level, right? So I'm requesting all of you to register and please do attend. And if you have anything new on the lids, function lids, I request you to send your in whatever the topic to Shubha and then we'll make the program and we'll let you know after this AIOS, okay? So, any other questions? Otherwise, we can disperse it. Okay. Thank you so much for your kind and patient hearing. Thank you.